morning everyone and uh, welcome to the award session of this edition of the VRSI. And with me on the dais are Dr. Murli Dair, President Dr. Manisha, Secretary and uh, Dr. Kim. So, the session is going to be a single session, there is a little confusion in the way the uh, card is printed. So, all the awards are going to be here and in case the hall is inadequate, it will be beamed live in hall B as well. So, let us start with the first award and I request Dr. Yanis Murli there who will be introducing us to the awardee, the Nataraja Pillai Oration Awardee. Dr. Murli there, please. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the award session of VRSI. This is one of the most awaited sessions in our annual meeting where the, all the awards and orations of the uh, society are given to the eminent uh, personalities and it is such a pleasure and privilege for me to introduce this year's awardee for Nataraja Pillai oration Dr. Srinivas R. Sada. Can we have a big round of applause for Dr. Sada. Dr. Sada is not, uh, he is very familiar with, 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 uh, with us, we know we have been seeing him in uh, many of our meetings, uh, he is a frequent visitor to India and a good friend of VRSI, I would say. I would say, you know, is a very, very good friend of VRSI and uh, takes a lot of interest in Indian ophthalmology and the Indian vitreoretinal, uh, you know, practice and society. Uh, to give you kind of uh, a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Srinivas Ayarshada, he is the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Imaging Research at the famous Dohini Eye Institute and Professor of Ophthalmology at University of California, Los Angeles, Geffen School of Medicine. He is the immediate past president of the Dohini Eye Institute. He received MD from, his, from Johns Hopkins University where he also completed ophthalmology residency and neuro-ophthalmology and medical retina fellowships in Wilmer Eye Institute. Dr. Sada's major research interests include retinal image analysis, advanced retinal imaging technologies and clinical trial endpoint design. He has more than 650 peer-reviewed publications and 20 book chapters and has given over 450 presentations worldwide. Dr. Sada is the editor-in-chief of the 7th edition of Brian's Retina. Science Retina is like Bible for all of us, you know, that, uh, you know, everybody is, uh, is, that's what we refer to. And he's the editor-in-chief of the seventh edition of Science Retina. He also serves as an editor-in-chief of Graphics Archive for Clinical and Experimental Ophthalmology. And he's on editorial board member of Ophthalmic Surgery, Lasers and Imaging, the Retina Journal, Ophthalmology Retina, Ophthalmology Science and the Ophthalmology Journal. Among Dr. Sada's awards and honors are a Research to Prevent Blindness Physician Scientist Award, a Senior Award from the American Society of Retina Specialists, an Achievement Award and Secretariat Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, John H. Zumberg Research and Innovation Award, the Macula Society Eng Investigator Award, the American Society of Retina Specialists Young Investigator Award, Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award, the Macula Society Paul Henkin Lecture and Award and the Uretina Lecture. Believe me, we can go on and on and on. The list of the achievements of this illustrious person is so long and we are really you know, honored to have him as one of the awardees of Natraj Pillai Oration. He is also a Gold Fellow and Trustee for the Association of Research in Vision and Ophthalmology. Dr. Sada's research has been continuously funded by the National Institute of Health for several years. That speaks for volumes for the uh, quality of work he does and the impact of work he does. And otherwise, it would not be funded by the National Institute of Health for several years, including a current or on grant from the National Eye Institute. I'm sorry, many of us may not know really what RO1 means. Maybe you can just tell a, tell a word about that when you when you you know begin your lecture. 
and he has been named the best doctors of America list for on on the best doctors of America list for several consecutive years. Believe me, friends, whatever I read is only a very small part of the achievements of this Dr. Srinivas Seda, who is here with us today. So, without wasting much time, I request Dr. Seda to give his Natraja Pillai oration of VRSI for the year 2022. Dr. Seda, for you, for you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Muralidhar, for that very gracious. Oh, uh, can, can you oh. just come and receive the award and then you can deliver the lecture? As I was saying, uh, Dr. Murli, thank you for that very gracious uh, introduction. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Kim. Uh, I really want to thank the society. This is an amazing honor uh, to, to be able to receive this award and to give this lecture. So I'm very grateful. And as Dr. Murli said, uh, you know, I've been really, um, it's been a great pleasure and honor for me to be able to participate in this society and, and with all of my friends here uh, over these uh, past many. So it's really a great honor for me. So I'll go ahead and proceed. I'm going to talk about a recent passion of mine. Most of the research in my laboratory is really focused on, on uh, Coria capillaris. And I wanted to hopefully get you excited about this area as well for the course of this lecture. Uh, again, it's a great honor to be able to give this lecture. I know that, uh, I, that uh, Dr. Subramanya Nataraja Pillai was a, a renowned ophthalmologist. Uh, he Known for his great service, he had uh, pioneered many eye surgery camps, and of course he's the grandfather of Dr. Natarajan who endowed this lecture. And so again, I'm very grateful to be able to give this uh, presentation. These are my uh, relevant disclosures. We do a lot of early developmental imaging with uh, many of the imaging companies. So again, the Coria capillaris. Uh, it's uh, again, as I said, a topic of great personal interest to me. Uh, and we are fortunate, we have amazing imaging technology now, uh, whether it be high resolution OCT, which uh, now allows us to get two micron axial resolution or swept source OCT, and we're finally able to actually get a pretty good rendering of the Cori capillaris on OCT. At the same time though, if we try to actually visualize the, OC, the, the Cori capillaris in an on FOS strategy to be able to better understand its morphology, and for example, you obtain a slab through the Cori capillaris, the structural OCT that we get actually really can't resolve the fine details of the Cori capillaris. Uh, and this is where OCTA, I think, has revolutionized our understanding of the Cori capillaris. Uh, you know, we heard a lot during the course of this meeting about the many advantages of OCTA. We've had good debates about its value, clinical practice. But for me, and again, I have a huge bias because this is a research focus for me, I think one of the most transformative aspects of OCTA and geography has been our ability to evaluate the Cori capillaris. Now, one of the things we may note uh, is that if you get a typical raw Cori capillaris image from obtaining a slab at that level, the image is quite grainy. And it's very difficult to actually see the interlacing sinusoidal architecture of the Cori capillaris. And there are many reasons for that. Some of that is noise, uh, but some of that is actually the dynamic aspect of the Cori capillaris circulation. Segments open and close at various times. And this is where uh, we had uh, published on the use of averaging. We're very familiar with averaging with structural B-scan OCT, but you can certainly do this with OCT angiography as well. And when you do averaging, you can actually obtain imaging of the Cori capillaris that more resembles what we might see with histology. 
Okay, so when we visualize the Cori capillaris in this way, one of the things that we often, we notice is that there are obviously spaces in between the, the, the capillaries. Uh, we call these so-called flow deficits or signal voids. There's been an evolution of the terminology. Most people have settled on flow deficit. You, we can argue about whether that's the best term or not. But in any event, quantifying the extent of these flow deficits has proven to be a very useful biomarker of disease, as I will argue. Now, what I don't have time to go through in this uh, brief uh, lecture is all of the nuances for being able to do repeatable and re reliable assays of the Coria capillaris. And actually, this, this purple box highlights our current methodology, and we've published extensively on, 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 on the rationale for why we use uh, this uh, type of a scheme. What I really want to focus on during the time I have is really what have we learned about retinal disease pathophysiology by our ability to be able to visualize the Coria capillaris. And I want to spend most of my time talking about aging and AMD, uh, in part because that's where the bulk of our research work has been, at least uh, recently. So uh, it became v apparent very early on in our, in our uh, assessment of the Cori capillaris with OCT and geography that flow deficits in the Cori capillaris increase with age. In fact, many have wondered whether this worsening of the Cori capillaris, whether that may be an important contributor or an explanation to why we undergo this transition between aging uh, to AMD. But you'd be interested to know that it's actually a bit more complex than that. Now, this is not maybe projecting so well, but the red line represents older patients, the yellow line represents younger patients, and it's apparent that the older patients have a greater flow deficit. But what this plot actually shows is this is the flow deficit in the Cori capillaris as a function of distance from the foveal center. And as what you see here is you get closer to the foveal center, that disparity between younger and older is greater. Uh, and so the fact that the flow deficits worsen, but they worsen more severely at the center, uh, we've uh, hypothesized may explain why there's a central predisposition of Drusen. And I'll try to argue that more in the next couple of slides. In fact, one of my fellows, Marco Nassisi, when he was with me, he actually studied the flow deficit below Drusen after compensating for any signal loss. Uh, and he demonstrated that the Cori capillaris flow deficit is worse underneath Drusen. And this led us to believe that the location of Drusen may not be stochastic, it may actually be driven by the Cori capillar capillaris. And he actually followed it up with a prospective study where he actually um, did a Drusen maps at baseline and at follow-up, and you can see this Drusen enlarged, and new Drusen appeared in this example. And he demonstrated that if you looked at those areas at baseline in terms of the Cori capillaris, the flow deficits were worse in areas where Drusen appeared or where Drusen enlarged into. So, um, so that really suggests that really the appearance of Drusen is really dictated by the Cori capillaris. Julia Cordetti, another fellow with me, she had actually studied the Cori capillaris in the context of neovascularization and demonstrated that around uh, these uh, neovascular membranes, there was actually significant worsening of the Cori capillaris uh, flow deficit. Now, uh, Ahmed Alagori, uh, a fellow with me, actually took this one step further. He said, well, okay, we know the Cori capillaris seems to be locally impaired around the neovascular membrane. What about further away? What about if we look at the peripheral macula, okay? Uh, and what he observed was, if you compare the chorea capillaris and the peripheral macula in type 1 MNV versus healthy eyes, there wasn't much difference. This was very different compared to G eyes with geographic atrophy, where the chorea capillaris, even the peripheral macula was poor. It was the chorea capillaris was poor everywhere in those eyes. Uh, uh, Federico Corvi, he, did, he actually took this one step further still, uh, where he looked at type 3 versus type 1 neovascularization. He observed that if you looked at the peripheral macula in type 3 MNV eyes, the flow deficit was worse compared to eyes with type 1 MNV. In fact, these type 3 eyes were very similar to geographic atrophy eyes, and we suspect that's why these eyes almost always develop atrophy. In fact, the current hypothesis is that neovascularization uh, in, the set, in, in the context of AMD develops as a response to Cori capillaris insufficiency. That's why it develops in these areas of relatively localized Cori capillaris deficit. And eyes that are capable of mounting a type 1 re response may have a partially preserved Cori capillaris. In contrast, eyes with type 3 neovascularization, the chorea capillaris is poor everywhere. So in order to generate the neovascular response, the RP cells have to migrate to greener pastures, go to the retina, hit the DCP, the retina, and that's where they stimulate the neovascular process. And of course, we all recognize, and this was highlighted, I think, earlier in this meeting as well, that there's an evolution in our 
thought process about macular neovascularization. Most now believe that macular neovascularization represents a compensatory or protective response. I explained to patients, last ditch effort by the eye to try to save the RPE and photoreceptors. In fact, when I talk to patients about wet AMD now, I say, well, it was a good idea, but it was poorly executed, uh, so they can understand the context of the disease. Freund and Curcio um, identified, they studied these lesions histologically and demonstrated that some type 1 lesions could develop a small vessel circulation, the anterior surface of the membrane, which had caviola and fenestration that resembled a normal choriocapillaris. So they speculated this was a neochoriocapillaris that was developing, and they actually demonstrated that uh, you can, of course, on OC angiography, see the membrane, but if you get a very thin slab at the very superficial aspect of the membrane, they could identify the small vessel circulation, which again, thought was the neochoriocapillaris, and you can see it blends imperceptibly into the adjacent choriocapillaris. We observed that certainly uh, neovascular membranes could be covered with this neochoriocapillaris, but there certainly could be areas where they were not covered. And so we actually, in the study, uh, um, compared uh, eyes that developed atrophy in the context of neovascularization versus those that did not, and observed that the percentage of coverage of by neochoriocapillaris was much greater in eyes that were protected against atrophy. So that seems to be an important biomarker. In fact, you can see that the, the percentage of coverage increased over time in eyes that did not progress to atrophy. So the greater the amount of neochoriocapillaris, the less likely that atrophy develops. And this, I think, really has implications for goals for therapy, future th therapeutic strategies. So the remainder of my time, I want to talk about other applications and other diseases. I want to talk about pachychoid spectrum disorders. I, I alluded to this uh, in the lecture yesterday. Uh, and so we know in choriocapillaris, uh, the choriocapillaris and pachychoid disease, we know that there, there can be an increase in choriocapillaris flow deficits in eyes that actually demonstrate evidence of disease. And this appears to be in the regions of pachy vessels. I illustrated that yesterday. Uh, and for example, in areas of pachychoid pigmentopathy, you seem to have greater choriocapillaris flow deficits, as this nice paper from Juan Keeley highlighted. Rick Spade more recently showed that, yes, you can have eyes that have a thick choroid or other features of maybe pachychoroid, but maybe not really disease. You don't see the degenerative or exudative findings, and those patients did not show choriocapillaris abnormalities. So what this has done is this really has highlighted that choriocapillaris flow deficits may be the key tipping point in pathologic pachychoroid. So our current understanding is that choroidal congestion leads to intercoroidal inj injury, which ultimately causes an impact on the choriocapillaris, and that's what leads to the degenerative and exudative complications of the disease. Well, what about myopia? Myopia is a very, it's always been a very interesting disease to me because these patients can have paper-thin choroids, and you always wonder, like, how can this be compatible with good vision? And we speculated that really, the vision really depends on the choriocapillaris. And in fact, we've demonstrated that, yes, if you have increasing levels of myopia, you can have an increase or worsening choriocapillaris flow of deficit, but you can see the differences are quite mild. And it's only in patients who develop pathologic myopia that you have much more severe choriocapillaris flow deficit. So it seems like that is a key a tipping point in the manifestations of the disease. And I have to tell you that it's not just due to stretching and ectasia, it actually seems to be actual capillary loss that's occurring in these uh, individuals. So the thought is that ectasia and choroidal thinning are reasonably well tolerated until the choriocapillaris is significantly impacted. That appears to be the trigger for neovascularization atrophy. This is just to show a patient with patchy atrophy, and you can see the choriocapillaris is diffusely wiped out in these areas of patchy atrophy and myopia. Let me turn briefly to inherited retinal degenerations. There have been many papers now that have demonstrated that choriocapillaris flow deficits can correlate with areas of photoreceptor injury. I think that has a lot of implications. Raja, I think, gave a very nice lecture about regenerative therapies and things of that sort in the future. Well, you can imagine if the choriocapillaris is quite uh, impaired uh, or lost in these eyes, that may have implications for the success of those therapies. We also know that, for example, in choroideremia, that the choriocapillaris flow deficits around the areas of atrophy can actually predict atrophic progression as well. I want to say uh, something about inflammatory uh, diseases. I think this has been a huge boon from OCT angiography. Uh, we, we, you know, you, many of you remember, uh, you know, of course, in placoid diseases like AMPI, you have hypofluorescence early on ICG. It's a very typical feature. And there was a decades-long controversy as to whether this was due to blockage from the inflammatory material or actually choriocapillary ischemia. And I think OCT angiography has really definitively given us the answer that uh, these patients do have choriocapillary ischemia. It appears to be a primary aspect of the disease uh, process, as we were able to demonstrate in this paper in collaboration with David Seraf. In fact, we've been able to show that these uh, flow deficits can improve 
some cases as the placoid lesions resolve and may be a useful biomarker to track response to therapy. I also want to highlight a, a, a paper that we did in collaboration with Vaishali uh, and Anirida um, on, uh, on their, um, their cohort of subjects with tuberculous suprigenous like choroiditis and to show that, you know, obviously some of these eyes can develop a paradoxical worsening. That appears to be in eyes that actually develop a worsening of the choriocapillaris flow uh, deficit. And similarly, again, you know, in terms of distinguishing different types of, of white dot syndromes, I think choriocapillaris imaging can be useful. For example, we know in MUDES you can have extensive photoreceptor injury, but the choriocapillaris is perfectly intact in these patients, which is very different from placoid diseases. And finally, I want to say kind of maybe the newest information. This is about drug toxicity. Can the choriocapillaris be the primary site? Drug toxicity. In fact, it appears that it can. Uh, one of my colleagues' work that David Seraf and I have done together, but David is one of the world's experts on pentose and polysulfate toxicity. Um, and we've demonstrated recently in this publication that you can have significant choriocapillary flow deficits with increasing doses of pentosin before the patients actually manifest the pigment epithelopathy that's characteristic of this disease. And I could go on and on if I had another hour or so. We could talk about many other applications, including in, in diabetes, uh, but uh, my time is limited. So I will really conclude here and summarize that, I th that hopefully I've been able to convey that assessment of the choriocapillaris by OCTA has really provided us insight into the pathophysiology of numerous retinal disorders, shown you how it's helped us explain the topography of Drusen predict neovascularization and atrophy, uh, also give us some insight into mechanisms of the pathology and pachychoroid disease, explain why patients with myopia can tolerate a thin choroid for a time until the choriocapillaris is affected, also given us insight into placoid choriretinopathies, help us understand the progression of retinal generation, and now actually even give us insight into drug toxicity. But certainly it's opened, I think, a new frontier of discovery in retinal disease. And with that, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my many fellows who contributed to the research projects that I've shared uh, in this uh, lecture. And finally, I wanted to make an acknowledgement and, and, and thanks to my uh, family. My wife, Mamta, is actually uh, here, and it's only with their love and support that I'm actually able to do any of the things I've been able to accomplish. So, so again, a, a huge thanks to them. And thank you to all of you for listening uh, to this lecture, and thank you to the Society for this award. Thank you, Vas, for that wonderful, wonderful insight that you gave us into the choreo capillaries. You know, that's so nice. Thank you so much on behalf of the society. Thank you. Friends, uh, we uh, have the pleasant task of uh, the next awardee with us, our next awards. To do that, I call upon our dynamic secretary, Dr. Manisha Agrawal, to introduce the next awardee. Thank you, Murlida, sir. A very good uh, morning to all of you. I do have the privilege and honor of introducing our next award winner, Dr. Shobha Shiv Prasad. She is very much a part and parcel of all of us, and though I really don't need to introduce her because she's often seen in all of our meetings, and though based in London for last so many years, she's still an Indian at heart, and we always see her clad in a in a sari, and that itself conveys uh, how Indian she is still at heart, having lived in London for the last so many years. And above all, she still makes an effort to bring all of us together and conduct a lot of research work in retina and various other pathologies. So Professor Shobha Shiv Prasad, basically she hails from Trivandrum, and she's a medical retina consultant ophthalmologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital NHS Foundation Trust and a professor uh, Dr. Shobha Shiv Prasad is a medical retina consultant ophthalmologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital NHS Foundation Trust and a professor in retinal clinical research at University College London she is the director of Moorfields Clinical Research Facility and the vascular theme lead for Moorfields Biomedical Research Center. She is the chair of the scientific committee of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists and led the AMD and RVO guidelines for the college. She has received several prestigious awards and delivered national and international name lectures 
for her lifelong work in retinal research. In 2017, she received the Macular Society Rising Star of the Year Award and was named the National Institute for Health and Care Research and Royal College of Ophthalmologists Researcher of the Year. Her Clarity Trial was a runner-up for the BMJ Best Paper Award for All Specialities in Medicine in 2018. And in 2022, this year, she received the prestigious NIHR Senior Investigator Award, a competition open to all specialities in medicine. In 2022, she delivered the Eva Kona Lecture, the U Retina Lecture, the Keynote Lecture at the Giridhara Institute Silver Jubilee Symposium, and the Matthew Davis Lecture in Madison, Wisconsin. Professor Shiv Prasad has published more than 400 peer reviewed publications and has been awarded research grants that total over several billion pounds. Her main research interests are clinical trials, imaging, and risk prediction. She works collaboratively with a large number of institutions, both in UK and globally. She is also the editor-in-chief of the prestigious Eye Journal since January 2018. And for us Indians, she is the chief architect of Smart India Study, uh, bringing together 20 centers across India, and which, of course, resulted in several publications, and last but not the least, the recent epidemiological study of diabetic retinopathy in The Lancet a few months back. And this actually is apparently going to help us in bringing about a policy change at government level for DR screening in our very own country. And thus her topic today, retinal research in India, which I think is the closest to her heart. Please come up, Dr. Shobha. Thank you very much. I'm deeply honored, uh, actually emotional about the whole thing. It's great to get this award, and I thank all the organizers and the VRSI committee as a whole. So, uh, and thank, me, thank you for all the presentations. My God, I, one after the other, really great. So I'm deeply honored, and my topic after Professor Sada's topic, which was purely science, mine has got no science in it. So uh, my topic is retinal research in India, and uh, as Manisha said, I'm really proud to be here to be presenting that. So these are my disclosures. I don't think any of these are related to my talk today. So the first question I would like to ask is, why do retinal research in India? So uh, to clarify, I would say, or to justify, the prevalence and incidence of many retinal conditions are very high in India. Given the population in India, the absolute numbers related to each of the condition is extremely high. It gives us an opportunity then to do research within India to publish reports that are important to India. Some disease patterns are very different to the rest of the world, and also there are regional differences between states or between regions in India itself. And none of these can be uh, related to overseas publications from overseas. We also have too much of reliance. Uh, we rely a lot on research published by either um, Western world 
or by other countries. And I think it does not always mirror the health needs in India, and it's an opportunity that we need to take research forward in India uh, to focus on India's health needs. Some of the conditions are highlighted here. Retinal conditions, like the rest of the world, is a growing public health burden in India, and especially so in India due to the high numbers of people affected by these diseases, such as diabetic retinopathy, AMD, TB, um, febrile illnesses. There's almost mostly prevalent in Southeast Asia, ROP surveillance, uh, inherited retinal diseases due to consanguinity, and of course, the rising prevalence of myopia. So I've only named a few, and you can already see a, uh, a, a great need for research in India. So India, if we do research here properly, we also can provide global solutions to a lot of problems. So health system in India is very similar to several health systems across the world in many low and middle income countries. We also have innovative approaches because of our large sample size and also due to the expertise we have in India that we are at present not actually utilizing much for retinal research. We have multidisciplinary expertise, we have the best IITs in the world, you know, we have technologies, etc. and we really need to hone into them and uh, develop our research portfolio. We also have a willingness to collaborate, learn and deliver. And as Manisha said, we learned a lot from our project, which I will highlight later, that we can work together and deliver very good results. I also want to highlight why India should do this. As you know, very recently, India has overtaken UK to become the fifth biggest economy or the fifth richest country in the world. Uh, based on their GDP, and if you look, and if you look at the six top countries, India is number fifth, and India and China are the middle-income countries that have reached the top. So, and it is also the fastest-growing economy, more than China. So, our comparator is actually China here, because the Western world has had lots of resources for a long time. And we need to compare with someone so that we can see where we are in terms of progression around the world. So taking that, I looked at PubMed indexed diabetic retinopathy publications from 1999 to date. And you can see very nicely that it's an upward trend. That is extremely good news for India. It is rising. But what I then did is I tried to compare it with China. And then you see that we are actually only doing about a third what China is doing today. And I, I, you might wonder why I'm comparing with China, but we should. We should be better than them, because our language here, at least for now, in medical colleges and our training program are in English. And we are all very well versed in how to write, how to publish, how to do work. And China has a disadvantage there, and we should take the opportunity to beat China. So we always complain about local challenges with retinal research in India. Um, and, and I can name a few. Ophthalmology as a subspecial or as a specialty is not a priority for our government or any of the policymakers because there are many other diseases, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases are still lower than communicable diseases in terms of policymakers' uh, thought process. So we also have patients who have um, inconsistent care because they run from doctors to doctors or from hospitals to hospitals and also cost is a major issue for retinal conditions. The cost barriers allow us to have a lot of loss to follow up appointments and therefore we cannot run studies that have long follow up etc. And um, researchers by themselves have no incentive to do research in the country because they have no allocated research time in most institutions. Most of the retinal specialists are extremely busy, and we really need to try and allocate time for them to do that. So these are all some of the challenges that we have, in addition to, of course, the legal hindrances we have in terms of global collaborations. So I thought, OK, if diabetic retinopathy isn't reaching that, I wanted to see what happens to other retinal conditions. So I looked up ROP research. And you'll see here that we are doing really well Maybe in my eyes, we could do better, but still a hearty congratulations to the ROP research group because they, they seem to be almost in line with China. 
So, um, and, and you know, we world-renowned ROP surveillance screening in India, and I feel that that should be published more and more, and, guide, and that can be used as guidelines and guidance for the rest of the low middle income countries at least, if not the Western world. I then looked at other PubMed indexed publications on various other common retinal diseases, and you can see that uveitis publications are in par with China. So, you know, they are exactly the same, and ROP just slightly less. So, it's only the chronic conditions of AMD and diabetic retinopathy that are falling behind, and I think we need to emphasize research in these areas, but not fall down on the existing good work that's being done for other conditions. So this also shows that local challenges are overcome by some research groups and not others. So it cannot use local challenges as a reason for not to do research. And so uh, that is why I wanted to bring this up, to show that everyone can do research here in India. There's also a perception of research from low middle income countries as being of poor quality, mainly around case reports, case series, opinion pieces, etc. And we need to change that. And this, the best way to change that is not as an individual institution, but as a collaboration. The more we collaborate, the more likely we will get very strong papers from India. When you look at the climbing, uh, the levels of evidence, at present we are still in the blue or uh, in, the, in the lower yellow to orange part of this ladder in that, as I said earlier, we are focusing ourselves on real world evidence, small cross-sectional studies, um, etc. And we should be aiming for randomized control trials, systematic reviews of randomized control trials. We can do it here, for sure. We have CROs. I learned from Vaishali Gupta that we have years of CRO expertise in this country. We know that so many centers have the ability to do clin have run clinical research facilities, and therefore I really encourage that we go up one step further and uh, go into cohort studies and randomized control trials as well. So with this, I just want to give you an example of a collaborative work that has turned out to be far more successful than I thought when we started it. This is the Ornate India project. It was funded by the Global Challenge Research Fund in UK. And uh, we had six institutions in UK, but we had 20 centers in India, as Manisha said. We tried to build up several projects to answer questions on diabetic retinopathy. So some of the challenges we took on was to, we wanted to look at contemporary data on national prevalence of diabetic retinopathy and vision threatening diabetic retinopathy so that we could influence policymakers and say, this is a problem, we need something doing. We also wanted to show the policymakers the national risk factor burden so that they would then encourage more NCD type control programs. We also wanted to look at various cost effective diabetic retinopathy screening models Unlike UK, you cannot run a diabetic retinopathy screen, national screening program in India when the population is so large. In we need different types of screening models. And here again, we were very successful in having eye specialists run screening models, telemedicine run screening programs, and diabetes department run screening programs. So this, several models can work. And we got down the cost to about 400 rupees per scan, per, per screening visit. We also realized that we cannot screen 77 million people with diabetes every year in this country. So we looked at pre-screening strategies by involving lab work, and I'll come to that later. So here again, we managed to come up with some pre-screening prediction models so that less that we have a triage system to help people sc uh, be screened. And as a result of all this, I I'm pretty proud to say that we have increased the research capacity and capability uh, to be a global force on research. The big question now is how do we sustain this? Because that's where, unless local leaders come up, uh, we will not be able to sustain this amount of research. And I'm pretty confident that we will. So this is the example of the collaborative grant that we did around the country. It's called Smart India Study. And you can see the number of sites from north to south, east to west, etc. And we have resulted in, it has resulted in our first publication in Lancet Global Health on the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy in India. So here clearly it shows low middle income country, especially India, can produce 
very, very important study published in the best uh, group of journals, Lancet Global Health. So, you know, you can change that perception altogether because of the collaborative effort. I'm also proud to say the authors are half males, half females. Females should come up and do research. We are not subordinates to males. Just keep that in mind as well. We, we also want to show that it's so not only the private institutions that can do result, research. We, this is the Naina Murdam project from Kerala, where we inst, uh, initiated diabetic retinopathy screening program in the family health centers, 16 family health centers within Trivandrum district. That resulted in prevalence data, risk burden data, etc., from Naina Murdam project. That resulted in the health health department of Kerala initiating a public health policy on diabetic retinopathy screening. We can do that. We have managed to get Kerala government to manage diabetic retinopathy screening program across the whole state now using retinal photography. So, you know, this is just another example where we can build research into policy. We also integrated with laboratory work, both from Aravind and Shankaranetrala at Chennai. And you can see here how we found that cystatin C marker in the blood can be used as a pre-screening strategy to, to screen people who are at risk of vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. One could state that um, this is the one study that's just published in JAMA, but I'm expecting more validation study. This is done by uh, Girdas group, as well as Rajalakshmi's group in Dr. Mohan's hospital. And I'm hoping AIOS will take this up as another major project and take this forward. We also have global collaborations as a result of this grant. We have managed artificial intelligence projects. You know, there are loads of uh, international collaborators who have come on board. We also have Professor Sadda's individual project also multi-center that is published. So it just shows that we can have several global publications. We have a India MACTEL study group led by uh, Ms. Dr. Girida. Again, a very good study uh, group that has got out publications that have never been published about this disease. We managed to get diabetic retinopathy screening guidelines through AIOS and VRSI. Again, collaborative work and also DMO treatment protocol. So this India multi-center study, and now a study group called the India Retinal Study Disease Study Group, have resulted in 70 peer-reviewed publications, guidelines, as well as policy. And I'm not here to boast about it, but I'm here to prove that we can do it in India, and I hope this will continue. So there are many other opportunities of retinal research in India. Innovation is key for India's current economic boom. We have several technologies that are you know, really first in India, and we should try and use it. As I've described yesterday, the biosimilars, India is in the lead. We have about 22 publications from India on biosimilars, but when you look at the details, there are about 18 of them are our opinion pieces or case series or real world evidence. Clearly, India should be doing the randomized, first randomized control trials on these biosimilars. They are made in India, so India should lead this retinal research. We also have, as I said, IITs, et cetera, many other technology institutes with artificial intelligence, and we don't need to rely on artificial intelligence tools from outside. You have to develop your own tools, validate them, and implement them in India, and then give it out globally. We also have electronic health records now, digital prescriptions, and digitization of India. I think you know better than me about the digital programs in India, so I would definitely want to see that happen. Training the next generation of researchers is key for sustainability. Uh, the institute should try and get some finance and alloc get uh, time allocated to researchers. And juniors in the audience, please do research because you can always do cataract surgery, VR surgery, etc. But to stand here in the podium, on the podium today and present, I'm presenting it just because of my research background. If I had continued just doing surgery, and just looking after patients. I don't think anyone would invite me to give me this uh, oration today. I would encourage every uh, uh, MD, MS, PhD, doctoral research to be professionally managed and get publications out in their thesis time as well. 
We have several funding agencies in India now, more so than any other country. UK is in recession. There's hardly any grants available now. So clearly, India is actually the best place to get funding at present. So um, I'm really glad that VRSI is now leading on taking on this India Retina study group. I hope there will be more collaborators and they will embark on new studies on it with simultaneous initial collaboration, uh, multi-center. Even though it's retrospective to start with is fine. We just need to build that culture first and then go on to prospective studies. And if interested, please uh, contact Dr. Manish, Manish Agarwal. So in conclusion, India is definitely progressing in retinal research. There are local challenges, but I should, we should take that as opportunities for research. India has the capacity and capability to provide global solutions to retinal research. On it, India is just one example of such a project, and I'm hoping in a few years you'll see several such projects in India. And VRSI is a good platform, and I'm hoping AIOS also will join SHIP and broaden India retinal research uh, network. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shobha, for that wonderful lecture. And I suddenly feel very empowered being an Indian and then being a woman researcher. Thank so you. thank you for reinforcing that. And uh, I'm sure after listening to you, uh, I think you've taught us in a big way that we can work together and surely make a difference. So thank you once again. I now invite uh, Dr. Kim, sir, our vice president, to introduce the next award winner. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Manisha. Uh, today, we are, uh, VRS is very proud to give this Professor Sohan Singh Hare, a great legend, whom we lost in the recent past. Uh, I mean, a remarkable scientist, par excellence, uh, who has taught us many things and on, uh, in ophthalmology. So we are very proud to announce the awardee, Dr. Pramod. Pramod Bende, I'm very, very happy to introduce Dr. Pramod, a good, very, very good friend of mine. It is very ridiculous to introduce to this audience about Dr. Pramod, but the protocol demands uh, that I do so. so Pramod, of course, is a well-known retina researcher, scientist, a surgeon par excellence, and a teacher, a wonderful teacher. He has had, I mean, I can list the entire list of his awards, but I think the, the, uh, the time is not enough to bring in, but he's there in all scientific media teaching about, uh, and his passion is in ROP. So, as uh, I've had a lot of opportunities being with Dr. Pramod in multiple situations as a personal friend, is an excellent, excellent human being and a wonderful teacher that I know of about him, the way he talks to the students. So I just looked at, just was talking to a few of his students. I know I don't want to talk about his scientific deliberation, scientific achievements, but as a teacher, this is from the words of his, not one, multiple students, that he is a teacher par excellence, the most approachable person. Everybody said that when they are in surgery, they want to be posted with him because they feel so comfortable operating under his guidance. And more importantly, he takes that extra mile to motivate his students. Believe it or not, he goes every Sunday morning to go spend time with his students teaching surgery, looking through their videos. A wonderful teacher and more importantly, an excellent human being. So VRSA is really proud to confer this award, Dr. Sohan Singh Hare's award, 
on Dr. Pramod. Dr. Pramod. At the outset, uh, let me thank SI. Sir, obviously, it's uh, embarrassing. We know I think Harry is, is a, it's a agent. And just to remember him, we were so excited to have him in Shankar Netralaya, 9 February 2022. Can I have a slide, please? So, These are our few memories. Uh, we all were excited when we visited and realized such an excellent teacher he was and with the enthusiasm, late evening, the, he was going on with his lecture. All of us were just spellbound. And you see this, all of our students and we all, like, we were so proud to have been with him that day. So coming back to the talk, Tarika strategies for the management of stage five ROP. Basically, stage five, Basically, with the new classification, we talk uh, divide into five A, B, and C. Stage just to so just stage five A basically is open funnel detachment. Five B where disc is not visible, so basically we call it as basically closed funnel detachment. And when you have anterior segment complications, we classify it as a stage five C. So aim of the surgery here is to clear all preretinal tissues up to the disc and up, open the peripheral trough all around to the extent possible to help tetel the retina as much as possible. Now, decision making for a surgical approach is important to understand the pathoanatomy. Look for a corneal status, look for iris, how well it dilates, iris atrophy, look for uh, iridocapsular adhesions. It's important to plan your strategies. What you see here, the arrow you are seeing, basically stretch or elongated ciliary processes and detachment of pastana here. That again change your decision making will come to that little bit later. Configuration of the detachment, how entirely the retina is pulled, and if necessary, we do ultrasonography that also help you in a decision making. It's important that most of these eyes we need to re-examine under anesthesia before you go ahead with actual surgery. You need to look for proximity of the retina in relation to crystalline lens and ciliary processes. As you again see this uh, small video, you depress all around and see whether you have extra space. If necessary, use a trans illumination uh, to find the clear space for your sclerotomies and assess feasibility of lens bearing vitrectomy in these eyes. We need to take other anatomical considerations, poorly developed past plana, have large globular lens, uh, narrow palpebral aperture, and thin sclera with a low scleral rigidity that also adds on while decision making. So these are different clinical scenarios when you uh, take a clinical surgical decision. The stage 5A, you, you can have a three different scenarios. You have open funnel, but the entire retina is still posterior. But this is less than 15% scenario. Majority of what you see is anterior pool retina. Probably there is with very thin translucent retroventral fibrosia, but for funnel is by differentiation it is open. You can enter the retina with the retinal lentil fiber pressure of this very very thickness. And then stage 5B, where you have closed funnel. Stage 5, you see particularly when you have corneal decompensation and this issue. Generally, they don't have real good functional and anatomical prognosis. So that, that brings us down when you should not operate. So you have a leukocoria since birth. 
and you have full term infants with a stage 5 like picture, probably you may not be dealing with ROP and have some other issues. Age more than one year, it's not a cutoff, but basically when you have more than one year and have a detachment such a long period of time, even technically you can operate, probably functional outcome may not be that great and so probably we avoid risk of anesthesia and taking these kids for surgery. You have associated corneal decompensation, generally it's usually a progressive even if you operate, they don't do well, so we do not operate most of the time. You can have a very fluorid disease, again this is a relative contraindication because very high risk of intraoperative ble bleeding and failure or abandoning the surgery. So sometimes you can delay the surgery in these eyes or you can just use anti provided you have space to inject anti that can be another issue. Significantly reduce axillary, close close configuration with a extensive subretinal echoes probably indicate underlying ultra blood. Again, these eyes they generally don't do well, probably we avoid surgeries. Instrumentation is always as we know any surgeon has their own discretion and availability of instruments and pathology to be addressed that dictates this decision. Most of these cases we do now 25 gauge or few with a 23. Infusion is generally through cells retaining 20 gauge AC maintainer that helps to better IOP control during surgery and low short instruments are preferable if available. Generally we use a microscope particularly stage 5 when you do deal with coaxial illumination for microscope is used but if there is an open funnel deep shallow detachment probably you can use a wide angle visualization system along with your endo illumination. So the critical decision here is where to make an entry. It is very very important have a proper site for your sclerotomy, otherwise you can land up in damaging the crystalline lane anteriorly or damage the retina posteriorly and also inconvenience of the instrument positioning as some, and that which leads to difficulty in accessing desired tissues and really couple complications associated with you really do not need to go with the sclerotomy as a local usual conventional sclera location. So that decision generally intraoperative you just take a move. You need to determine the position of the retina in relation to the ciliary body and the lens. Entry site can be either through cornea, limbus and sclera, we will come to that in the next few slides. Meridian as I said depends on pathology to be addressed where you can easily access the tissues. AC maintainer definitely helps, generally we push through cornea and the inferotemporal cordon and also for a 25 gauge when I use, I use 23 gauge entry. And for 23, I'm using use a 20 gauge entry. Basically, ease of move, moving instrument inside the eye without causing a drag on the sclera or peripheral tissue. Otherwise, that itself can lead to dialysis and probably will end up losing the case. Now, whether to two port or three port, you just see the first video. Generally, we used to use visco to maintain the globe and then continue surgery, but it keeps on losing and intermittent hypotonic can be issue. Now, we started using AC maintainer. So you comfortably continue surgery without any hindrance that helps with a better intraoperative IP control and have a better hemostasis intraoperatively. When you go through the sclera, again scleral entry, as you see here, I generally depress and see look at the ciliary processes area and if I have space there, then probably localized scleral entry, uh, conjunctival opening, generally entry between somewhere 0.5 to 0.75 millimeter from the limbus just behind the iris. And then, of course, AC maintainer is placed and continue surgery under your microscope illumination. However, if there is no space, generally you can go through the clear cornea. This is the first video as you see, continue surgery. Of course, AC maintainer is there or you can have an entry here actually, again, one entry through the limbus and the other entry through the limb, one is behind the limbus and other through the limbus through the iris root because there was not much space that side. So every case is different. So you choose your location of the sclerotomy that sometimes dictate your success of the surgery where you start the surgery. Pupillary management is equally important. If you're lucky enough, mobile pupil if you have, you can just either dilate swell, no issue, but otherwise you can use adrenaline in infusion fluid. If a pupil is bound down, iris hooks can be used temporarily and sometimes your iris is atrophic with a tonic pupil. I would prefer sector irectomy between superior sector rather we will take out which gives a, if an excellent visual visualization during surgery. Avoid frequently iris prolapse through the sclerotomies and with our experience we learn when iris is flabby over a period of time few cases we lost because retinoiridal adhesion because this loose iris falls back 
and it not could not did not see, settle because of irritational adhesion. So this removing this iris does partly help in a surgical success. Coming to the lens management, so we try lens bearing vitrectomy, but it's in a stage five when I deal with is a very very small group. Most of the cases need lens vitrectomy when there is an fibrovascular proliferation is anterior to equator and then distance between a lens and this membrane is too narrow to dissect it out. But when you pan the lens ectomy, ensure you remove the entire lens and what I am trying to show here is don't pull the capsule because sometimes zonules are very very strong and this pulling the capsule itself can lead to dialysis, case ends there. So hold the capsule with the forces and what I am doing is actively cutting those zonules with the cutter my, and slowly slowly just rolling it off and as it comes out partly separating from posterior tissues also and then once you are sure everything is clean either you chew it with cutter or this is the last part of capsule posterior capsule is taking out so uh, when you are dealing with open funnel detachment here again entry through the sclera just 0.75 millimeter you can create the opening in the fibrous tissue either with a needle or directly with cutter or using a scissor and once you get that edge you try to dissect from that point, spreading slowly going towards the periphery. And once you lift that membrane with a forcep, sometimes cutter or user, when as comfortable you are and depending on space you have. So, and once you have the right plane, quite sometimes you really do not have to cut this tissue, just keep on tapping and then keep on dissecting. Just that itself sometimes help to just separate this fibrous tissue. Basically, it's a contracted vitreous and it just help you to separate it from the retina. Coming to close funnel or what you have is a thick fibrous tissue or retrolenter tissue. Now, this is always a question where to start center or periphery and when you look, uh, critically look under the microscope, you will see whether I have a space between those fibrous tissue in the center or periphery. And then depending on that, you decide. So if you start with the center, if you want to, I just prefer this linear incision. I feel for my paint. Disposable needle is a sharpest instrument, least traction on the membranes and the retina. So cruciate incision I prefer to give which can be extended with a scissor and once that is done and probably you move further with remaining dissection. As again sometimes if you have a trough with a periphery there is a gap enough or particularly where the trough is quite broad you can initiate this dissection in the periphery and actually it gives a more complete dissection because here you achieve better plane and then extend the incision all along the periphery all around 360 degree as you keep on topping keep on cutting this and keep on rolling this entire membrane as we do here just ensure that you don't cause unnecessary tug on the you see ciliary process are getting pulled once we have a central incision uh, four flaps are made and then you go around circumferentially cutting this all fibrous tissue again okay? Keep on changing your hand because depending on angle sometimes can be awkward and just actively we involve both the sclerotomies so it's always better if you, you can manage ambidextrous surgery and once your periphery is removed peripheral traction transvitreal traction is taken care of and then you start extending your dis dissection posteriorly slowly snipping those attachments go down deeper Again, everything, entire surgery under your microscope illumination, and this is what your central persistent hyaloid system is out. And what the moment it comes out, you see entire funnel is open now, and you very well see the peripheral trough as well. So these are a few pictures. Yes, they are not very encouraging when you compare to other uh, diseases we see. But what keeps on going us, driving us, is because still these babies can have some ambulatory vision, which otherwise would have been lost everything. Just to conclude. Surgery for ROP stage 5 is one of the most challenging problems in VR surgery. Each case is unique and needs individualized approach. Detailed pre-op examination and understanding of a pathoanatomy helps to plan the surgical steps. Though overall prognosis is poor, few patients do get ambulatory vision and we have a best patient I think available in 618 vision, one of those that's like a what exceptional situation but at the age of 21 patient is still managing. A parental counseling and long term follow up is an integral part of management of the ROP. Thank you once again for VRSI organizing team and thanks for patient listening. Very humble to have it. And it's a, thanks to my management to have it. Thank you, Nitala. Thank you once again.
Thank you, Dr. Pramod. As repeatedly again, you have shown uh, excellent, excellent. The videos are wonderful. The way you show and the handling of uh, stage 5 ROP cases is really, really remarkable. Thank you for sharing this and congratulations again. Thank you very much. Next, I invite Dr. Mahesh to introduce the next awardee. It's my pleasant duty to introduce uh, Yuyans Mishra, the number of some young researcher award. Next slide. We had about five nominations for this award this year, and we had a panel of respected judges experienced people went through the TVs to select the winner of this award. Dr. Chandra Abraham, Dr. Lingam Gopal, Dr. Nidhar, and Dr. N.S. Murli there were the judges and I thanked them, bottom of my heart for doing this. And out of these four people, two people selected Deviance as the first choice and, uh, and one of them selected Deviance as the second choice. Now the next slide. Evans has many alphabets uh, behind his name. I don't know when he got them, though he has been with me for the last 10 years. And I think a couple of alphabets are missing in this 26 English alphabets. I presume the next four or five years he'll be getting them added to his name. Next slide. Despite his young age, he has got about 62 pair of publications and four textbook chapters. Right. Nine prestigious awards, and one of them includes the Colonel Rangachari Award. Prestigious Khan Rangachar Award awarded to him in 2018 AOS. Right? Continues his research and education. He is a PI and co PI in multi centric international trials and is a reviewer for many journals and is a presenter in many international and national meetings as well. Next slide. His interests have always been ocular imaging, starting with the smartphone and now OCT and Octa. He's a wonderful VR surgeon. I have seen him do wonders with his surgeries with my own eyes and he has got in-depth knowledge of various aspects of vitreoretinal diseases. Sometimes so in-depth I find it a little frustrating when I discuss with him certain issues and his recent interests have been ocular oncology and ROP surgery. Next slide. As a person he is of a very amicable nature. So you go stand in his OPD, his patients are uncles and aunties actually. So much so there is one particular grandmother who is insistent on giving his granddaughter to him in marriage. So knowing that he is married, and I am sure I am going to get hit by Hiral after this. And we are fellows and students love him. He got a lovely wife who he is with us today, Hiral, and a wonderful son whom you can see playing around. And he is a go-to man for me. So I have a concept, I just have to like sound it to him and next few days I know that like he will work on it and come back to me with how to go about making it done. He is one of my pillars of support. And uh, I welcome Divyansh to deliver the Young Researcher Award lecture. Uh, morning, respected all, and uh, it's it's. I I am lost for words to what to talk and what to suggest, but I'm extremely thankful, honored, blessed, 
then I feel God is there. So, thank you again. So, uh, the award oration which I am talking is uh, by uh, Dr. Nampirimal Swami. So, most importantly, his teachers of all. And he is a founding member of Arvind Dai system and is currently a, a chairman emeritus, professor of ophthalmology. And I am very grateful that I am talking about diabetic retinopathy, which uh, I hope if he would have been here, he would be liking it because that's his one of the forte. He has received numerous awards and allocates, which include uh, Padma Shri Award by Government of India and Lifetime Achievement Award by AIOS, uh, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Society Association, and Achievement Awards by American Academy of Ophthalmology. No financial disclosures. I would start my presentation. This would be the paper which I would be discussing about. This is a paper which we had worked long time back, 2017-18. Diabetic retinopathy screening using smartphone based fundus imaging in India. So this was an association with University of Bonn when I was in Germany for three months of my tenure over there. Uh, from, I had a uh, overseas kind of observership over there for three months. At that time I met one of the doctors and over there and then he was also uh, interested about smartphone imaging and that's how we came up with an idea of uh, this uh, study. As we know, diabetes around the world in 2021, right now we can see that Southeast Asia tops off that where we have 90 million people who are diabetic. In India, to talk about in 2019, there were alone 77 million people of having diabetes and which is expected to increase as we are seeing is 100.95 million in 2030. Yes, if we have diabetes in the diabetic retinopathy would also come hand in hand. As we are seeing, the Southeast Asian countries have a little higher prevalence as compared to other world. So that was the need of the study. So one, we discussed certain points. The first was we need to identify some cost effective diabetic retinopathy solution which can be easily publicized or utilized. Financial factors and barriers for widespread implications like if you have a very costly product with you, you may be finding it not very easy to uh, sell or either utilize in periphery and screening by non-physicians that's very important because as we all being VR surgeons every one of us is busy in the OPD we want that at least if not us either our optometrist if not that probably the trained technician can go and then uh, do the remote screening and if possible a mobile health service where we can have a teleophthalmology so having such costly cameras were out of the uh, thought process at that point so one of the device which is a big headache right now and which takes our sleep in the night and probably we keep surfing is the device which is always in our pocket and sometimes we are completely engrossed in it. So the need for study was to utilize a smartphone based fundus imaging an inexpensive option for a mobile fundus examination. Most of the reported studies were by the manufacturers themselves so it had a little bias in data and it was done in a tertiary hospital settings and very importantly, usually in a high, highly developed countries. And there was no comparison of these devices which they had utilized. So as we being we are surgeons, there are two types of ophthalmoscopy which we can view the fundus. One is a direct ophthalmoscopy and another one is an indirect ophthalmoscopy. I want to call this as direct and indirect smartphone ophthalmoscopy. So the advantages are similar of direct and indirect what we know. The advantage being in direct, very important, very minimal learning curve. So even a first year resident can do a direct ophthalmoscopy and very easily identify what's happening. Easy to use and it's an erect image. There is no confusion what is happening. The disadvantage is this is small FOV. But how we manage it? By dynamically moving in different quadrants and seeing. Indirect ophthalmoscopy, yes, obviously it has the biggest advantage of having a larger FOV or a field of view. Peripheral visualization is possible and in cases because if the patient has peripheral tears or something and if you have to operate, so indentation, but the disadvantage is a steep learning curve. The inverted image, the lateral inversion, there are many things associated with uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy which uh, not even a postgraduate but even in our fellowship also we need to learn about it. So this is a kind of a depictive image that how we would see an indirect image. And this is how an image would look like when we do a direct ophthalmoscopy. So there are small, small sectors which we would keep seeing, but it's very easy to use. 
and less user dependent. I need not have a very advanced expertise to identify, okay, what is in the inferotemporal periphery. Field of view is, is a little smaller, but diabetic retinopathy, as we know, is a posterior pole disease. So we need not have a wide field. Yes, the vogue is to go wide field, but it comes with a cost. So can we do something minimal or uh, even uh, people who are not so learned like an optometrist or probably a technician would be able to screen it? As you can see, the lesions which are on the posterior pole are very well seen by just the direct image of the 5 degrees to 10 degrees which we are seeing. So in this case, what we did was three different uh, pones which are uh, 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 modalities or devices which we use. The first one, as we can see, is the peak retina, which is uh, from uh, Peak Vision UK. Another one is a DI device, which was from Pravoda, Italy. This is a DIY, that is the device which we had created long time back in 2014. It's a small LED light with a 12 volt battery, which is kept very close to the phone camera and it is utilized like a coaxial illumination and that is how we bypass everything and you would be having an image in any phone. The another one was the indirect device, which is a paxoscope. And there was an ideal fundus camera, which we usually take it for a DR screening. This was a Trinetra, Porous camera. So this is the published literature which we have published how to do an uh, direct ophthalmoscopy and if you have to do an indirect ophthalmoscopy right now there are many adapters which can be utilized. In this case we did around 13 camps and as we are seeing it was far wide apart. It was not in Bangalore but in peripheral rural areas. The inclusion criteria was more than 18 years of age and known or suspected diabetes mellitus. They, we had done a random blood sugar at the site anything more than 200 was considered uh, to be diabetic. Exclusion criteria is known allergic to dilating drops because yes, the dilatation is important. Shallow anterior chamber, we were doing torch examination and if we are finding that it's a suspected shallow anterior chamber, we were not uh, dilating. And if the patient is not willing to come into the study. So coming to the clinical data, this is how we did the video. As you can see from the disc, then goes to inferior, then goes to macula, then temporal, then again coming back to disc, then superior temporal, then inferior uh, nasal, then superior nasal. So we trained the optometrist which we had. So we uh, identified interesting people who had some interest to perform this because it requires a lot of task. It's, it's like the same person would undergo at least five examinations. Yes, it was taxing to the patient, but nothing that we had lost. A lot of data, which is very important. Six optometrists, as we are seeing for three days, we gave them the training and how to acquire images and how to do competently. So it's not about just acquiring macula and leaving other areas. We want at least the posterior pole, the, the at least 30, 35 degrees where we know the diabetic changes would occur. So these are some uh, videos. The first one is from the peak retina, which is our first device in the study in the reference as you can see yes we are able to see some areas of the retina but there is a lot of reflexes the diy is little better where we can see the reflexes are there but uh, we can uh, we are seeing the hard exudates blood vessels disc macula clearly uh, the lower image is what uh, we did with the diy where we had just put a small led and as we can see the quality of image is good except it's utilizing only that five degrees and a reflex which is much temporal but it's not affecting the quality of the image where we have to identify whether it is referable or not. We are not treating this patient because if, if it is get referred, it's best. But yes, this is the indirect where we can see the wider angle and much more details of the image. The compliance of the image protocol was assessed, that was assessed using stepwise scale, which we had developed because the, such kind of scale was never there. So that's what we have published. We can skip this. Analysis important is that we had around 682 eyes. Of that, the 301 were non-diabetic, so those were excluded. The eyes which had uh, primary included in the studies were 381. Of that, the three patients which had a poor, uh, the media was poor, so that's why those three images were only lost. So it's not that we have lost a significant number amount of images. So eyes included were around 378. Then we had two observers who had graded this, and this was completely unbiased. We did the study, then the data was taken back, and then assessed later on. It's not that we are identifying, and because I have done the imaging, I would know okay what this patient has. He has mild or moderate. So to avoid that confusion, a third person was given all the data, the videos. There were around some 1,200 repository of videos which were provided and marked. And if there was any discrepancy, the senior ophthalmologist would use to prefer uh, to uh, review the videos and then confirm the diagnosis. So this was the semi quantitative analysis scale, what we are seeing. So this kind of direct uh, scale was not there and that's what we did. So sharpness, which was graded into grade 3 to 1, depending upon the blood vessels, whether there are clear or not. 
and reflex is if it's showing us 10 percent of reflex or more than 10 percent 30 percent or more than 50 percent contrast and illumination depending upon whether the blood vessels are seen in stark contrast with the uh, retina results as we are seeing the age uh, the average age was around 56.64 plus and minus 10 uh, years of age uh, males and females it's approximately 60 uh, 60 percent of ma females and 40 percent of males why because probably it was on the daytime and uh, probably the males would have gone out for work that's what was exp uh, understood out of this as we are seeing the lens status was uh, fairly divided as we are seeing the patient had clear lenses even had a little cataract also pseudo fake x also so it's not that all patients are having clear lens and that's what the image was good no as we are seeing over here, the patient had the, the diabetic retinopathy. This is the international classification, stage 1, 2, 3, 4. So no diabetics were around 66% in that advanced diabetes, 4%, uh, the grade 4 was only in 1% uh, or so. Maculopathy in 14% and no maculopathy in around 86%. So the number of cases uh, which required referral was around uh, 102 eyes. Of that, 45% uh, were having DR or a diabetic retinopathy, rest having a cataract. And other reasons we could identify was branch retinal vein occlusion, ARMD that was dry and wet, glaucoma, a macular hole. So uh, this is to summarize that how the images were. The sharpness as we can see is more so equal in all direct and indirect. And as I have marked in red the last one, the DIY and the Paxos is doing equally well. The reflex wise also more of more both of them are doing equally well contrast and illumination uh, the direct device has a little more uh, uh, lesser areas of uh, contrast comparison time that how much time we would require to take an average image so as we can see this is a second so that means around 68 seconds would be required to use a peak retina ophthalmoscope and the diy it would re require around 79 the DI, it would take a little more than 90 per seconds, but yes, the indirect, as we can see, first most, it has to have an expertise, understanding, hand-eye coordination, and a lot of understanding how to do an indirect ophthalmoscope, as we are seeing minimum of more than 1 minute and 10 seconds are required. Sorry. So the compliance to the imaging protocol, as we can see in indirect, because we are seeing better, that's why we are able to comply with the protocol, but all of them were equal in uh, the protocol where we had complied uh, imaging the uh, all the areas which were required. So this was the diagnostic accuracy, which is the final result, which we could come out with that, as we can see the direct, the third device, which is the DIY device, which we had created, had similar kappa uh, values as to the, uh, of the indirect as we can see and diagnosing of any in the, any dr is nearly similar as what we can see around 79 or 80 percent to around 94 99 percent in cases of uh, indirect devices and referable or referral warranted dr it's little lesser in cases of indirect but as we can see the, it's near to same it's not significant uh, uh, statistically maculopathy in this case the problem was unless we see in hard exudate we would not be able to call it as maculopathy but in a, 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 in a indirect because the quality of image is little better i would say we were able to see some areas of cystoid changes also so these are the comparative images of all the three devices the first column these are the general cases which are comparable the second column that's why i have segregated we can see the ma the, the maculopathy cases and even a case which has a proliferative disease were also able to pick up in most of the uh, devices but it was better in the device which we had developed Intergrader reliability, again, as we are seeing over here, the kappa coherence was near to uh, uh, good coherence, but it there had issues with the diabetic maculopathy, as we were discussing, because unless an hard exudate was there, we would not classify it. So the novel finding from this study, it was the first study comparing different approaches using smartphone uh, fundus ophthalmoscope. It, it was evaluating fundus quality images, which was not done before examination time again this was the first time we did that and uh, how it is applicable to doing a dr screening and most importantly a real world outreach where we went to a, a, a area where it's not that we have called to the hospital and then done the screening over there so all realistic environment was tried to uh, uh, be performed so discussion wise there are two studies which were done before one was using the di device where as we are seeing the data is comparable Another indirect device by Tony Toy et al. was using a Paxoscope. In our study, we have utilized, as we are seeing, all the four devices, and these are comparable to the results what we can see utilized by the other studies. So the strength and limitations. First, it's a direct uh, 
smartphone adapter which can be attached to in our study we have utilized all samsung galaxy s8 at that time it was available the image quality we had utilized was a semi quantitative and not a quantitative analysis because such kind of classification was not there till now no masking of image because if we repeatedly do the image evaluation we would come to know okay this is of which device versus another device the diagnostic accuracy of the, the devices was uh, identifying the maculopathy was a little lower as we were discussing the so re relatively low prevalence of severe diabetic retinopathy and that is what has been found out in other studies also so the take home message is the smartphone uh, uh, based fundus ophthalmoscopy is feasible for screening dr in low resources and yes very importantly virtually ubiquitous smartphones or any smartphone can be converted to that inexpensive and it can be used as a mobile screening very important countries like us or any other countries having low or middle income countries where uh, utilizing this device is very helpful you just need to have an led light and have a battery pack your device of an direct ophthalmoscope is ready so some images when we were doing camps as you can see loads and loads of patients and sometimes there were lenient times where we were having food at the campsite and there is one area uh, in bangalore which is called as nandi hills we went to that also because some camps were done very close to it so again last but not the least i want to thank all my contributors and my co colleagues at that time who had helped me and most importantly my head of the department and boss dr mayesh thank you thank you again thank you very much uh, dr divyansh i'll uh, take a couple of minutes of your time can i have my slides a wonderfully inspiring lecture by dr shobha a little bit more inspiring to the ladies let me introduce to introduce you to this so all of us are aware of this we have the largest pool of we are patients and a talented of specialists so we talk about ourselves despite which and a group of specialists to take care of them but then all along we have been following western guidelines and data so isn't it time that we generate our own data and guide to guide us as well as the rest of the world next slide so let me introduce the vrsa study group so we have already constituted the vrsa study group next slide so what is the idea behind this is this will welcome collaborative research ideas from its members it will help set up protocols and execute multicentric studies it will help establish treatment protocols tailored to a populace as well as practice patterns we have already set up a vrs study core group which will oversee the working of this vrs study group but it's a tall order but then we have already begun next slide we have already completed the first study and it's already pending publications have been accepted for publication and we decided to address the core issue an issue an elephant in the room which none of us are willing to see so the reuse of instruments and the risk of endophthalmitis so we have done this study using like across 25 centers across india starting from up north to down south and east and west next slide the title of the study is the incidence of post vitrectomy endophthalmitis in india a multicentric study as i mentioned it's been accepted in i it's just pending publication so we got some very good uh, reviews just telling us how good the quality of data can be from our country so the referee one the referee number one to quote them said that this is a well written paper by an esteemed group of colleagues i believe the paper should be accepted with minimal revisions referee number 3 was a little bit critical but then it was also towards the positive it said the data in this paper are interesting but the organization of the manuscript is poor next slide the section editor wrote that it was a pleasure reading this article it has implication as it gives one of the first piece of evidence on the reuse of instruments needs minor revisions as suggested by the reviewers and associate editor also said that it's well done interesting topic of great importance just to say that the data which comes from within us can be of significant importance so we have already completed the study and the next year we we are going to develop the concept of vrsa study group and more studies under the vrsa study group banner so this will be open to all of us so any of us who want to participate can become participants in these studies or propose the 
the title of the protocol or protocols and then the VR essay will facilitate. Funding is an issue, but this study was done without any funding. And of course, like we we will be working towards making this a possibility and look forward to all your support, all your participation, get to have quality data like what Dr. Sobo was mentioning coming out of our country, which will guide us as well as the world. Thank you very much.